Salutations once again to the Truth Corps, whoever and wherever you may be. It's a cold, windy morning here in the mountains of northern Spain. And as I woke this morning, a wave of different reflections swept over me. And the strongest of those reflections came with an emotion of gratitude. So as I was sitting there having my coffee, I just steeped myself in that feeling of gratitude. And I wanted to say something about it. There's quite a lot I could say about it, really. You know, true gratitude is mutual. So the gratitude I have for you and the gratitude you have for me is mutual. And it plays both ways and it builds. And I wanted to say something about that. But I don't know exactly how to start. And as I was pondering it, pondering what to say, as I sit here and gear down, get down into the silence of my bones so I can go and revise my book, my rigpa, that's a code word for attention, took me back to the place where I grew up. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something for me after you hear this talk. Go and search for the Friendship Sloop. Friendship Sloop is a boat. And it's known all around the world, especially among connoisseurs of sailing. It's a very special item in that world. And it so happens that although I was born in New York City, my first memories were of a place on the coast of Maine where this sloop was built. And at the time that I was a boy there, I believe it was the only place in the world where they built friendship sloops. There was a building called the Lash Brothers Boatyard, located in Hatchet Cove. And in that boatyard, the Lash Brothers, they were a big family in the town, constructed boats of all kinds. They made little tugs. They made lobster boats for the local fishermen because the town was a fishing village, a lobster fishing village, and still is. And on some occasions, when someone came along who had enough money to afford it, they would build a friendship sloop. So let's see what I can tell you about the mystery of the Friendship Sloop. As some of you may know, one of the fundamentals of what I teach, you could say it's the basis of everything that I teach, comes in the proposition that Life is a dream. You are living in a dream. But it's not your dream, and you are not the dreamer. When you seek to know who the dreamer is, in whose dream you live, 
really and materially, it's totally real. It's not an illusion. It's not a simulation. It's not a phony hologram. It's a living dream. And when you seek to know who the dreamer is, and when you come to know, then you know the mystery of life. You arrive and you reach the mystery of life at its core. And that mystery is the same for everyone because the dreamer is the same for all of us. So that is the essence of what I teach, really. And when you move into it, you find that the dream and the knowledge of the dream is awesome. It's endlessly rich. It has a magnitude that cannot be measured. And it determines the fabric of your life. Your life is woven into the dreaming of the wisdom goddess, she who turned into the earth. I've written a lot about the ancient mysteries of the pagan world. And why were they called mysteries? Just asking for a friend. Well, those seers and mystics who founded the mysteries knew how to reach the core of the dream, the dream that produces the world where you find yourself today produces and sustains the world and the dream, the power of the dreamer that directs the course of this world. If you are attracted by the proposition that you're living in a dream, you'll see that it immediately gets better Immediately, the possibility arises, a kind of adventure. And this adventure involves getting to know the dreamer. Just consider it for a moment. I've often said that each one of us has two identities. There is who you are, and then there is what you are. So, who are you? Well, it's a mundane formula. You are someone with a name, a birthplace, parents. There's information on your driver's license. You are someone who lives in a country, in a culture, and that's who you are, personally. What you are, that's something else again. What you are is not your social identity. It's your transpersonal biological identity. And in that sense, you are an actor, a character in the living dream of that divine presence that has taken the form of this planet. There are many ways to explore this mystery. And I emphasize again that it's the same mystery for everyone. So there is unity in knowing about the world dream. And everyone who explores it consciously learns to follow the same techniques. There are techniques, there is a method 
for the living gnosis. That is to say, to know in reality exactly what it is and to know how to interact with the dreamer. All that is real. It's as real as anything you've ever experienced. So there are many ways to get to know the dreamer and to see your part as a character in her story. You're like a fictional character in the story of an author or a filmmaker. But you have the special advantage of working with the author to develop your role. Your role is not written in some final way that you can't control. In fact, the outcome of the world dream is not written and not decided or determined. The way the dream works out depends on the interaction between the dreamer and the characters in her dream. I believe, I am convinced, from the evidence of practice and from the testimony of untold numbers of people, that this is the most powerful proposition that can be embraced by the human mind. Now, one of the ways that you can know that you are participating in this dream, that you are following the designs and purposes of the wisdom goddess to whose greater life you belong, is by sailing close to the water. So I offer you that trope, sailing close to the water. The water, you could say, is the mystery. In fact, water has often been used as a metaphor in ancient myths and in many legends to describe the mystery of life. And there's a scientific truth in that as well, of course, because life came out of the ocean, didn't it? Sailing close to the water, well, that's what you do when you're on a friendship sloop. Sloop, by the way, is a boat of a special design. It has an elegant curvature. In certain ways, it could remind you of a, of a Greek amphora or a curved lamp. It has the, the elegance of a swan. Now, a sloop is basically just a single masted sailboat with one head sail. But there are also sloops that are designed for warfare. It's a small vessel, smaller than a frigate. There's actually something called a sloop of war. And it has all of the guns on the deck, not below deck. And it's small. And it sails low in the water. So imagine that you're on a sloop. Now there is the area in front of the helm, the cabin area, and you stand there, but the deck of the sloop, which surrounds you, is higher. And generally, it's about the height of your hip, or a little lower. So the deck of the sloop, of course, runs around both sides, up around the front, so you can walk up along the deck and stand on the front of the sloop, and it curves around at the stern. And there's a piece of wood that runs around the border of the whole deck, from the point of the bow to the stern, and that's called the gunwale, G-U-N, 
W-A-L-E, pronounced gunnel. So it's actually a piece of wood that is generally rounded. So you could put your hand on it and you could grasp it with your hand. And in that way you grasp the sloop, you stand inside on the floor of the cabin, but you can lean toward the deck and you can put your hand on the gunnel and you can lean, lean on the side of the sloop. And you can lean out and look down at the water. Now, one thing about the friendship sloop is that it's cut very low. And so at moments, as the boat turns this way and that through the wind, it tilts. And sometimes it tilts so far that the gunwale is only an inch or two above the water. So if you're standing there with your hand on the gunwale firmly and the boat tilts, well, you can actually feel the water on your fingers sailing close to the water. If you look in the information that's available on the internet, you'll find that the word sloop is of unknown origin. It seems to be a Dutch word, but as a matter of fact, almost exactly the same word occurs in a dozen other languages, Italian, Norwegian, Finnish, French, almost exactly the same word. Yet the origin of this word, sloop, is unknown. But I have a sort of gift for exploring the meaning of words. And it seems to me obvious that that sound in that word plays toward another sound. It plays, for instance, toward the word slew, S-L-E-W. So what does it mean to slew? Well, the car slewed on the icy road, you see. It also plays toward the word slalom. So what does a skier do in a slalom? Well, they weave back and forth, right and left. And that is the motion of a sloop. That's the motion of all sailboats, of course, that they weave back and forth in the wind. They veer in one direction or another. But because the sloop is designed so that the cut or angle or curve of the deck is very low, when the sloop swerves, it sails really close to the water. In order to know and enjoy the mystery of this living dream, you sail close to the water. And out of the water comes the mystery of life and also the clues, the clues that guide your life. So sailing close to the water means that you train your attention to follow the clues. The dreamer gives you clues. Everyone receives these clues. I've said this before in several talks. Everyone receives these clues. The difficulty is to retain them and to handle them correctly. And that is a challenge, that is a test. But it's essential to the art of living in the personal and transpersonal style to follow the clues and sail close to the water. So I ask you to picture how the sloop moves through the water. 
elegant like a swan, go look at pictures of friendship sloops and imagine how it swerves and slaloms. It veers to the right, it veers to the left, and the boat tilts one way, and the boat tilts another way. And when it tilts down on your side and you're leaning on the gunwale, feel the water run across your fingers. You feel the whole ocean touching your fingers. That's how she gives you clues. This beautiful, elegant dancing motion of the sloop equates to another phenomenon that everyone has seen in nature. When you see flocks of birds in the sky and they form those swarming masses, the murmuration of starlings. Have you seen that? A massive flock of birds, some hundreds, maybe thousands, all flying together in the sky, and they make a dark mass. And not one of them runs into the other, not one of them crosses the path to the other and knocks the other one on course, does it? They demonstrate a morphogenetic field. And notice how it plays. It surges in different directions. And then at a certain moment, the whole mass of the flying birds turns. It turns and pivots in another direction. And often the shapes that are formed are infinity shapes like the two loops of the Lorenz strange attractor. That is the living action of a morphogenetic field right before your eyes. That is an expression of the lyrical beauty of the dreaming of the Earth Mother. There's a poem by the German Romantic Rainer Maria Rilke that expresses describes the murmuration of starlings. It's from the sonnets to Orpheus, and it goes like this. Choose to be changed. Oh, be enraptured by a fire that shows not what's changing in it as it burns for the directing spirit of the earth entire loves the figure of flight not so much as the point where it turns. So you're watching the murmuration of starlings and you see the figure of flight and then you see that instant when the whole flock of birds pivots. That is the point where it turns. That is 2021. That is now, the point when the world dream turns into the beauty to come. The same description applies for the sloop. It sails in the wind. It moves ahead. Maybe it's tacking against the wind. And it moves through the water, over the waves, and then comes the point where it turns and the boat tilts and you lean toward the mystery and the mystery gives you its clues. All you have to do is pay attention. But of course, you have to know the story, the narrative about how the earth came to be and how you came to be here. And when you know and love the story of your divine mother, it changes your life forever. I said years ago, and I can't tell you how many people have thanked me for saying so, that when you enter this adventure 
of the world dream as a knowing character, knowing what you are to her, you realize that your life is not your own. It was never your own. And it is so liberating and so transcendent to know that. No, I'm not saying, I'm not proposing that everyone who survives in the beauty to come will know what I am talking about exactly in this way. But some will. Some will. And they will be the quantum of conscience in the next world beyond the nightmare of the Soviet regime. Back in friendship, there were times when word went around town. Most of the population, well, a third of the population of friendship was the Lash family. Only about a thousand people living in friendship then, and even now, I think it's a little more than that. Word would go around that they were building a sloop down at the boatyard. So I would go down there, age about 10, 11. And inside they had this huge boiler that filled with water. And they cranked it up, set a lot of wood into it until it really shook and it really got hot. It was a rather ramshackle affair might remind you of kind of like the boilers that they have in where they make moonshine liquor. And attached to this boiler was a big duct, and the duct ran into a kind of a tunnel that I think was lined with tin inside. And so this tunnel would fill with steam, and then the workmen in the boatyard would take these beams that they had Uh, cut in a particular way with the big saws that were there. And they would slide these beams through this tunnel and leave them in there. They'd do it one at a time. And they'd leave it in there until it got soaking wet and very, very hot. And then they would pull it out with gloves, of course, and they would take it over to the frame of the friendship sloop. And they would lay it up on the side and bend it, bend it, curve it, and clamp it in place. That's how they built the hull of a friendship sloop. And I used to watch this process with awe. I just thought it was so incredible. And I loved it, especially because I knew that when the hull was completed, they would give me a little work, and I could earn a few dollars. How did I do that? Well, I did the caulking of the hull. So they would give me a bucket with some kind of sealant in it, some kind of tar. And they would give me a big bundle of a coil of caulking line, which is like heavy cotton. And I would take a little paintbrush and a stick And I would lay that caulking line into the seams between these beautifully curved, crafted beams of the hull. And then I would, well, first I would put in a layer of the sealant. Then I would lay in the line of caulk. And then I would put sealant over the line of caulk. That was my job. I used to get paid a few dollars for that. And then I would have the pleasure of watching them launch the sloop. But I never got on a sloop. I never got on a friendship sloop until I was at least, I don't know, 32 years old. The reason being that friendship sloops were only made for rich people. And I was a poor town boy. And we didn't go. We weren't invited on those beautiful crafts that were made 
by the carpenters in the boatyard. But I got on one finally, and I have to say, it was a sublime experience, and now I'm on one with you. And we're sailing close to the water. Enough said. And I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come. <laughs>